Sky North and particularly of interest to us with the Lake Air Basin, but today we're going to talk about the ecology of Lake Air Basin fishes. And I'll leave you to uh, carry on from here. Thanks, David. Thanks, Dave. And thanks, thanks for uh, coming, everyone. <coughs> Firstly, uh, I'd just like to acknowledge the Ghana tr traditional owners of this country, but I'd also particularly like to acknowledge um, the traditional owners of the country in Lake Air Basin in which this work was conducted. There's way too many to, to name them all, but I'd particularly like to highlight the Adyamatna, Arabana, Aranda, Dairy, uh, Wonkonguru, Yarrawaka and Yandrawanda people who have helped us greatly with our understanding of the system and really enhanced our understanding of their country. I'd also like to thank my uh, colleagues that are listed on the, on the talk here. Um, but particularly, I'd like to thank Dale McNeil, who was uh, instrumental in getting the, this project going. So, the, I guess the benefits of long-term broad-scale monitoring programs are, are, are fairly well established, but they're often neglected on the basis of cost. So after several years of uh, grappling with that challenge in, in Lake Air Basin, the, the Lake Air Basin Rivers Assessment was established on a uh, shoestring budget with a, a no regrets approach. It's a, a cooperative project between three states and territories and the Commonwealth, and it's largely driven by the, the passion and enthusiasm of stakeholders uh, in, the, in the large region. And I guess that is evidenced by uh, the, the Lake Air Basin Partnership recently winning the International River Prize, We're getting a bit of recognition there. The ultimate aim of uh, Lake Air Basin Rivers Assessment is to assess the aquatic condition of um, or, or the assess the condition of aquatic ecosystems in the basin for the uh, 10 yearly state of the basin report. That, uh, this presentation is going to look, look at the strengths of the LEBRA monitoring program um, and highlight some of the outputs from the recent Goida Lake Air Basin project that's going to enable us to better assess the health of aquatic e ecosystems in Lake Air Basin. So the Goida Leb project was tasked with consolidating our conceptual understanding uh, of fish community ecosystem health, verifying this through empirical models, and then re refining those models when necessary, and then using these models to inform condition assessment methodology. For those not familiar with Lake Air Basin, it's located in the arid centre of Australia. It's one of the world's largest endorheic basins with several river systems uh, feeding into the lake, including the iconic Cooper Creek and the Georgina Diamantina rivers, which flow into the uh, recently dual-named Cuddy-Tunda Lake Air at, at the heart of the basin. Flows in these rivers are, as Dave mentioned, largely unregulated, and the basin is understood to have had fairly low anthropogenic impacts, in, in contrast to many other systems in Australia and globally. <coughs> It's, as you can see, it's arid, it's remote, you've, you've got to be able to look after yourself. It's home to some of the most naturally variable si river systems in the world. The rivers are, are highly ephemeral with, uh, with many flowing less than once a year. The hydrology is highly variable with unpredictable volume, timing and duration in comparison to many, many rivers globally. So this is a hydrograph at uh, Kalyamara uh, on, the, on Cooper Creek. As you can see, there's several very large floods, but mostly um, almost no flow at all at that location. And then in comparison, in comparison to other major rivers in the world, they're much more, have, they have much more predictable and regular flows. And, of course, the rivers vary greatly spatially from rocky upland streams through large channel country waterholes, um, extensive floodplains and down to hypersaline lakes. Uh, the aquatic, and along with this, the aquatic biota of these rivers have adapted to the naturally variable hydroclimatic regime that's characteristic in the system. Increased agricultural and industrial development, invasive species and climate change all pose potential threats 
emphasise the importance of improving our knowledge of how this system works and to produce methods for monitoring condition. Despite efforts to establish baseline condition in Lake Eyre Basin uh, over the last two decades, the variability of the climate and the associated biota made establishing ecosystem condition difficult. So it was the primary aim of this project to establish models that describe the fish community dynamics in, in the basin to provide a context for assessing ecosystem condition. Over the last 15 years, a large amount of fish assemblage data has been collected across the basin using a range of sampling methods, but largely based on, on fike netting. This has provided a reasonable amount of long-term data, although some of the methods have been inconsistent and the, the data is a little bit fragmented. The spatial coverage over this time has also been inconsistent, but at least for the last five years, Lake Eyre Basin Rivers Assessment has sampled methodically at all the sites displayed on the map here, with all the major rivers sampled and quite good spatial coverage. There's also been additional sampling uh, through related projects that have piggybacked onto, onto Lake Eyre Basin Rivers Assessment, and this has enhanced the coverage in some of the, in some of the areas. The sampling effort has captured a huge number of fish and also it's captured all of the species that are expected for the region. It also coincided with a, a period that included widespread floods in the basin followed by an extended drought. And just to give you an idea of how, how big a flood you can get, that's, that's the, uh, once again the hydrograph at Kalyamara with for a couple of days, um, half of Sydney, the volume of Sydney Harbour flowing through that point a day. So from all of that, we should be in a good position to try and understand how the system works in terms of the full variability you would expect to encounter. However, the, some of the, as I mentioned, some of the discrepancies in sampling methods mean that uh, arid flow and lebradant Le Lebra data aren't necessarily directly comparable uh, in, for, for all of our analyses, including for the fish assemblage analyses. Also, standard um, right slide, yep. Um, standard ordination methods only revealed so much about the data, and so while there were some patterns apparent in the data, yep, we needed a more sophisticated approach. So first we looked at the relationship between the fish assemblage and flow. This was key to understanding how fish with different biological traits respond to the various aspects of flow, explaining their distribution and abundance in the system, and testing our conceptual understanding developed earlier in the project and through, through various through years of, uh, of sampling. It's hard to tease out the most important flow metrics from uh, multivariate data sets, and there were gaps in the coverage of flow gauges that made it difficult to generalise the fish response to flow using data from every site. So what we needed was a method that maximised the use of flow data that was available to us. To do this, we developed a hydroecological response model using uh, generalised linear mixed models. This enabled us to maximise our data by generalising the results across all sites and catchments where flow data was available. By analyzing, tra uh, analyzing trait groups rather than individual species, we were able to further generalize across ecologically similar species. It also enabled us to combine some of the data from previous projects and the, the four or five years of LEBRA data. The trait analyses were conducted using 29 biological trait categories. And this was done by cluster analysis, analysis using a modified Gower similarity measure. This revealed nine ecologically relevant trait groups. So then modelling was undertaken for all nine trait groups and two community metrics. Initially, each of those trait groups was modelled against separate flow metrics, so cease to flow period, mean daily flow, coefficient of variation of daily flow and flood days, 
to identify all the significant linear relationships. And these, measure, uh, these metrics covered periods from 90 days to one year, two years, five years and ten years. And then the results of each of those were analysed for significance and effect. All of the significant metric, metrics were then combined into a single mixed model. This model controlled for site and, and methods as random effects, which enabled those results to be generalised across the basin and allowed those da the data from previous projects to be used, um, um, so with, uh, projects with different sampling met methodology could be included in the uh, analysis, so especially arid flow, which had four or five years of data. <coughs> The model was refined by a stepwise process to reduce the number of factors to those that best explain the patterns in trait group response to flow metrics. Without going into all of the, all of the analyses, um, I've sort of just summarised some of the basic patterns. So the significant factors for the catfish were uh, related to drought disturbance whereby they, they tolerated shorter periods of no flow. but but not longer periods of, of no flow. Desert gobies were associated with factors related to long-term stable um, low flow. Gambusia and carp gudgeon were related to a large recent flow event. Glassfish and rainbow fish were related to regular seasonal high flow. Hardyhead and smelt were related to factors enabling long-term dispersal and tolerating long-term drought but not short-term disturbance. And as expected for some of these widespread species like barred grunter, spangled perch and bony herring, they were related to factors reflecting uh, long-term low flow and also drought, uh, which reflects their adaptation to the harsh and arid conditions prevalent across that, the region. Goldfish were related to factors reflecting high flow with short-term drought disturbance. And large, longer-lived species like grunters and yellowbelly were related to factors reflecting conditions that enable long-term dispersal and migration and uh, flow over recent and longer time, time periods. And this group was also the only one that was negatively related to vi high variability in flow. Sorry, I just realised I haven't been getting through all of the slides. Um, So in, in general, there was a, a complex combination of flow metrics for different trait groups, with some temporal and, and uh, spatial factors significant, which reflect the, the uneven distribution of species across the basin. However, the overriding emphasis was on fish with varying levels of response to flow metrics, uh, which enabled rapid dispersal, and flow metrics requiring survival uh, survival of disturbance such as flooding and, and drought. So after establishing the relationships between fish and hydrology in the system, the next approach was to model the spatial distribution of fish assemblages. And we did this using a state and transition model. This approach uses classification to test a priori hypotheses of how fish assemblages should be grouped and then defines them based on how they behave over time. This resulted in a um, you know, fairly horrific looking table showing the occurrence of um, different states, both spatially and over time. In, in this talk, I'm going to focus on, on Cooper Creek, but we've modelled other rivers in the basin. And, but the best way to represent this is, is in a map. So starting in 2009, which was a, a, a dry period, the river consisted of uh, an upper zone defined by fish populations that were dominated um, by transient, resilient, small-bodied fish species, a middle zone that was defined by stable populations of mature and large-bodied species, and a lower zone that was, that was dry. At the initial onset of flood in 2010, samples throughout the system were dominated by mature populations of large-bodied species representing widespread dispersal and migration of fish throughout the system. 
protracted flooding in the system over 2010 and 11, resulting in large areas of the system being dominated by transient, resilient, small-bodied species, taking advantage of the inundation of the highly productive floodplains and resulting in huge recruitment events. At the same time, an area of the system remained dominated by large-bodied species. As flows diminished and ceased in 2012, the system became further spatially diverse with salinity tolerant species beginning to dominate in the lower part of the Cooper, but highly resilient species still dom uh, dominating the mid reaches of the river. Over 2012 to 2014, the system moved into a dry period marked by low flows petering out in the mid reaches of the system. The lower reach became further dominated by salinity tolerant species, while many habitats dried up uh, completely. The mid reaches stabilised into mature populations of large bodied species, while the upper reaches were still dominated by resilient species. And then in 2015, we're in the process of, a, um, of still analysing that data, but the lower reaches are almost completely dry, and there have been very low flows in the upper reaches. So we predict that the system will look uh, again like it did in 2009. So what we found was that the broad, the broad scale whole of system analyses allowed us to, to detect patterns in the fish community that aren't apparent from just looking at a small section of the system, as has happened in previous studies. A variety of short and long term hydrological factors contribute to the observed health of the system and point towards a highly resilient and resistant fish community. Importantly, our analyses enabled us to assess aquatic ecosystem health within the context of the hydroclimatic regime and the spatial setting. By providing this context, we've been able to adapt the uh, biological condition gradient approach by creating a set of criteria to assess condition relative to the species trait groups and spatial and hydroclimatic system that we find in this system. This has provided us with a basis for informing the State of the Basin report that we're currently preparing for the Lake Eyre Basin Ministerial Forum. <coughs> Thanks. Well, we're swapping speakers, so people often turn in cycles.